Hello and welcome. Uh, we will pick up with practice interpreting proton NMR spectra. Uh, this is video five from chapter 15. And uh, this video will have the same um, learning objectives and problem set problems as video number four. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So when you are looking and working at these proton NMR problems, you really get to pretend that you're a little chemical detective. So they're a lot of fun to try to put together the puzzle pieces, if you will, to figure out uh, what you've made. Uh, so let's get started. So here we know that we have a di-substituted alkene that's not geminal and it has this formula. So if I go through the successive steps that I gave you in the previous video, uh, and I added that sort of step zero is um, just what you're given. So in step zero, we want to identify what a di-substituted alkene is that's not geminal. Okay, so let's just review what a di-substituted alkene is. So here we have our alkene carbon-carbon double bond and around it, if it's di-substituted but not geminal. So geminal means that you have two hydrogens here, but we're told it's not geminal. So I have R groups. Now I don't, I can actually draw it out because I don't know if this is cis or trans. So I'm just gonna go like this. Um, so where R represents alkyl groups, I don't know if these are the same or if they're different yet. But this would be an example of a di-substituted alkene that's not geminal, okay? Because here's what geminal is. Geminal. Alkene. And that's what we don't have, so I want to kind of get rid of that. So this is our step zero. What can we glean from the information provided? Step number one was to find the degrees of unsaturation. And for that, remember, I'll give you the formula. It's the number of carbons plus one, so that's nine, minus half the number of hydrogens, that's eight. So I get one degree of unsaturation. And I know that that one degree of unsaturation is because it's an alkene. So there's no ring in addition to this or no other multiple bond, okay. So after counting um, the degrees of unsaturation based on the molecular formula, the next thing that I want to do is count the number of proton signals that we see in the proton NMR spectrum because that will tell us the number of proton environments. So sometimes if you have um, high multiplicities for, for just maybe one or two hydrogens. The peaks, it's really hard to read, and when that happens, I'm gonna tell you how many peaks are there. All right, but how many signals do we see? One, and it's a doublet. Two, and it's eight peaks. Three, this is also a doublet. So I'm seeing three signals so that means that there are three proton environments. Now, right away, I'm thinking fabulous because that must mean that this is a very symmetrical compound because we have eight carbons and then have hydrogens to put on those. And if there are only three proton environments, there must be symmetry in the molecule to only have three proton environments. Okay, next let's take a look at the chemical shifts. So we know we have an alkene, right? And that alkene protons, we expect these to be shifted uh, farther down field than the protons attached to sp3 hybridized carbon atoms. So I'm expecting, uh, you know, way down here, I'm going to expect to see uh, this, this is for the alkene protons. Okay. Um, and then if we look the farthest up field, so remember that around one is where we see our methyl groups. 
So I'm expecting uh, this to be from a methyl group. All right, and so after the chemical shifts, right, we can look at the splitting. And sometimes you'll see me kind of do both of those together. So let's see where we're at right now. So I know that the uh, CH, these are the alkene proton environments. Here, this is the alkene region, right? And I'm guessing that uh, these must, um, this has got to be a symmetrical molecule because there's just one signal here and here and here, just three signals. So these are groups. I'm going to guess that they are identical to each other in order to just have a total of three uh, proton signals. All right, so this must be from these CHs. Uh, this up here must be a CH3, and then based on the splitting, so the chemical shift here told, tells me it's in the CH3 area. Um, and what is it attached to? So if it's a doublet, that means that it's attached to a CH. Okay. And if we look at now what these pieces are going to be, if we have a total of eight um, carbons, right? I've got one, two, so I have six more to put on. So I'm going to guess that I have a CH3 attached to a CH over here, and then I still have my CH like this. So then this needs a fourth bond. So it is this. This is a sorry, that was a big gap there. So I'll just draw a line. Um, so if I make something symmetrical with eight carbons, so let's count here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and then we have how many proton environments? A, 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 and A. All of these methyl groups are in the same environment, right? And we've got three, six, nine, twelve. 12. So we should expect a really big intensity like what we see here. And they're attached to a CH, so a doublet. So this is signal A. And then these are in the same environment. I'll go ahead and call that environment B, right? We have plane of symmetry here, it's symmetrical. So these must be making this signal down here. So remember that this proton doesn't split this, but it is split by this proton. And this proton environment, I'll call that C. So HB has one neighbor, so it's split into a doublet, okay, doublet, and this was also a doublet. So this one was the doublet the farthest upfield, this is the doublet that's the farthest downfield. Now what about the signal for HC? It has how many neighbors? Three, six, seven, seven plus one is eight. So eight peaks, and that's you wouldn't have been able to count that, so I, that's why I told you that. Um, but here we have um, that even-numbered multiplet, the octet, uh, that is for signal HC. So this is for signal B, this is for signal C, and this is for signal A. All right, that's pretty fun. Now that the symmetrical ones are always kind of my favorite. Oh, before I forget with this one, um, can we tell, based on this, if we have a cis or trans alkene? We can't tell. So I'm just going to let you know you can't tell whether it's cis or trans from this. So uh, you don't have to worry about, that's why I didn't draw it out indicating if it's uh, cis or trans, okay? Now on an exam, if you drew just one of them, the cis or the trans, I would accept it because it still fits this, okay? Um, but I'm just letting you know from this, I can't, we're not able to tell if we have um, a cis isomer, a trans isomer, okay? All right, let's do another one. So let's take the look or take a look at a mono substituted 
geminal alkene with the formula C6H12 that has uh, this spectrum. Okay. So step zero, let's just figure out the given. Okay, mono substituted geminal alkene. So that's a big chunk. So geminal alkene, mono substituted. So I can put either the H here or here, but then the other piece has to be an R. I'm gonna put it down here so that I can kind of erase the R and add in. So I already have this piece, okay? So I'm already going to expect to see, since we have a geminal alkene, in the alkene region, I'm going to expect to see a signal with small j value. And in fact, remember that was your clue. When you see that small j value, that's telling you that this is for these. Now, are these gonna be equivalent to each other? No way, right? So this is A and B. Why? Well, for any mono-substituted geminal alkene, they can't be symmetrical because you're not gonna have a plane of symmetry here. If you had this R, let's say this was a methyl group and this was a methyl group. Um, so this would be an example of then a di-substituted geminal alkene. Then these two would be equivalent. But here in this particular case, uh, these, are, these are not equivalent to each other. Um, but we know that where I have labeled this as small j value, this is for signals A and B, okay? What is this, this messy looking thing? I expect it to be this as a mess. Um, it's still in the alkene region. And remember that if this is an alkyl group, the protons attached here are gonna split this as well as this and this. We saw that in the last video, how messy the splitting diagram gets. So this would be an example of what I call a mess or a big mess, okay? All right, um, let's see, I'm getting ahead of myself already. Let's take a look at our degrees of unsaturation. So after we figure out what the given information tells us, let's take this other given and find the degrees of unsaturation. Six plus one is seven minus half of 12 is six. So one degree of unsaturation, and that's due to the double bond. So there's a double bond, it's, there's no ring, there's no additional double bonds or multiple bonds than this. Okay, so now let's move on. The number of proton environments is the number of signals. Okay, so I've got one, two, three, four. Let's say we hadn't figured out that this was for A and B already, and I did five, six, so I would have said at least six, six proton environments, maybe more because of uh, this, this messiness here, right? Um, so we know based on this formula, um, we're not gonna have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. Um, we know that um, we're not gonna see a lot of symmetry here. So this is the other extreme case. In the previous example, you saw very few signals relative to the number of um, carbons and then hydrogens attached to them. So we knew it was very symmetrical. This one is not gonna have any symmetry. Each, uh, each group of protons attached to a carbon is gonna expect to produce its own signal. All right, so that's useful to know, right? Okay, so we then want to look at the chemical shifts. I always like to start at the extremes and then come in. So we already know that these are um, due to alkene protons, okay? And we've got already here uh, alkene protons. So if I have for the small j value, I can label those as A and B. And then let's call this environment C. That would be this, okay? Um, and uh, the reason I'm putting the HC here and not including it here is because HC is not a geminal proton. So it, these are labeled as small j value, so these are the geminal proton signals. Okay, um, then I'm gonna go to the other extreme. I'm gonna go way up field. I'm gonna start at my methyl group. So notice when you start up here, you're starting at the ends of the molecule, right? 
Um, so this has got to be a CH3. So I'm going to go ahead and write down, I've got a CH3 somewhere and it's got to be somewhere at the end of this R group. Okay. And it'll be the farthest, it'll be the, the CH3 that's the farthest away from the carbon carbon double bond because it's the farthest up field. Attached to it, if we look at the splitting, since it's a triplet, that tells me it has two proton neighbors. So let's guess it's attached to a CH2, okay? So I'll go ahead and label this environment D is for this signal here, okay? And then this is still in the chemical shift range of a methyl group, um, but it has is split into a doublet. So I'm going to guess that I have another CH3 that this time is attached to a CH. Okay. So if this is environment signal D, I'm going to call this one uh, signal E just so it's uh, different. Okay. All right. So how many carbons? These are all pieces, right? How many do we have so far? I've got one, Two, I know there has to be a carbon here. Right? So there's something here. And I have, uh, so if I just, let's say that I am counting just these two, like one, two, three, four, and I'm guessing this five and six, and I have just six carbons here. We've got to start fitting these together. So if we have a CH that is attached to a CH3 and that CH is also attached to a CH2 followed by a CH3, let's do a check. How many carbons do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so that fits that and I've got the right number of hydrogens. Now let's go through and evaluate uh, the splitting for each of these. We already did these. We said this signal should be the farthest up field and it should be a triplet. So I'll just write triplet here for these. We said this one, another CH3. This time um, it's split into a doublet, so it's attached to a CH. So this one was our doublet. Okay. Now what about this signal and this signal? Okay. So we have a CH we know is going to be farther downfield than a CH2. In addition, this CH is also closer to the, the uh, alkene environment. So between these two signals, I expect this one to be farther down field compared with this one, okay? All right, so let's look at this hydrogen. So how many neighbors does it have? So attached to this carbon is three. I'll try not to screw up my counting this time. Four, five, and then over here, six. So it has six proton neighbors. Six plus one is seven. So that's a septet. And sure enough, again, it's really hard to count that. You could tell here that this is an odd numbered multiplet if you look really closely, but when it's small like that, I like to blow it up. Because it's integrating for just one proton, it's just really hard to see. So this proton must be making this signal. And then here, let's check this. How many neighbors do we have? Three, four. So four plus one is five. So that should be a quintet, okay, five. So over here, if I zoom in, it's hard, kind of hard to see, but this is an odd numbered multiplet with one, two, three, four, five, okay. All right, now um, I, I've practiced this a lot. And so um, I tend to, as I'm interpreting these, come up with uh, what is often turns out to be the correct answer. As a student, when you try this, you may first come up with something that doesn't fit. But if you follow what I just did, you will catch yourself. And then you will say, okay, I, gotta, I have to change this around a little bit. So we'll see, maybe we can have a teachable moment of that on the next example. 
Um, but if we don't, it's like with balancing equations, um, you often uh, don't get it in your first pass or your first attempt. You have to go back and, and make changes. That's how uh, these problems are too. And the more practice that you get, um, the better you're gonna be at it. So that's why you have so many problems uh, given to you in the problem set for this section. So let's try another one. Let's say that you are given a primary, acyclic means no ring, um, and this is my abbreviation for an alcohol, okay? But let's say like on an exam, how it would be worded something like this. Proposed structures for the following primary, acyclic, in this case we just have one of them, alcohol, uh, that fits the following NMR data, okay? Or the NMR spectra, we don't have NMR data. It's the NMR spectra. I notice that I've given you a starred signal. So the starred resonance uh, disappears upon shaking with D2O. So in my previous video, I talked about how this proton uh, signal disappears with that D2O shake because the deuterium replaces it and then it absorbs in a region uh, that's actually like way not in here. Um, so this we already know is from the OH of the alcohol. Okay, now what else do we understand? Let's start with step zero. So from the given, so it's a primary no ring alcohol. So what is a primary alcohol? So that's where our OH group is bonded to a primary carbon. Well, what's that? That's a carbon that's only bonded to one other carbon. So this has to be a CH2 attached to something, okay? And th I mean, this has to be some kind of carbon out here, but this is what a primary alcohol is. All right, so we already know that this hydrogen is for this signal, okay? All right, before I go further, let's not forget the degrees of unsaturation. So four plus one is five. And then I'm gonna subtract off half of the hydrogens. Oxygen is not in the degrees of unsaturation calculation, so you don't have to worry about adding that in here. All right, so we have zero degrees of unsaturation. So no rings, no multiple bonds. Okay, now let's continue. The number of signals that we see, this was, that tells us the number of proton environments. One, two, three, four four proton signals and we have protons on four between to share between spread out over four carbons so again i'm not going to expect to see symmetry i'm not going to expect to see lots of equivalent protons all right so that's good to know now let's look at our chemical shifts we already did this one so then i'm going to go to my other extreme so this is going to be for a methyl group right because it's around 1 ppm so I know that I have a methyl group here and since it's split into a doublet that tells me that it's attached to a CH it just has one proton neighbor okay all right and then um, if I want to like where do I want to go next um, so if if for me what I like to do is I know that in an alcohol so um, we're going to see uh, this proton signal, okay? If we're excluding, since we already know this one, the one that we would expect to be uh, the next farthest downfield is the one that's closest to the oxygen, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and look at this signal and say, okay, that must be for this. And due to the splitting, since it's a doublet, that tells me that what's here is a CH, okay? Now we already figured out that we have a CH3 attached to a CH, that was over here, right? So let's go ahead and put that in. Okay, and then what else do we have? Well, there are only four carbons, right? One, two, three, so we, we just have one more, and to make an octet, this must also be a CH3. So these two 
should be equivalent to each other, right? But they still would make a doublet. Now this has a bunch of neighbors. So let's check ourselves. I'm always like, I don't know if this is the right answer. Let's see. So this proton uh, signal will be split. We've got six, seven, eight neighbors. Wow. So this should be nine peaks. And that's in fact what we see here, nine peaks. Okay. And that chemical shift makes sense because it's a CH. It should be a little bit farther downfield than one, right? But it's not going to be as far downfield as this CH2, not because this has two hydrogens, but because it's closer to this oxygen, right? So these protons are making this signal. This proton is making this signal. These protons are making this signal. This proton is making this signal. Well, that's fun, okay? Um, so you can see here, it, it takes some practice. Um, so, so do the practice, but don't be discouraged if on your first go around, you, you come up as you're doing this and you're like, oh wait, it doesn't fit. And then you have to come up with something else because that's really normal. Okay, in the next video, we will uh, go over carbon NMR and we'll wrap up the chapter.